Hello, everyone. Um, we'll be starting the integrative behavioral uh, integrative health breakout session now. Uh, my name is Sharon Hui, and I'll be moderating this session. Uh, to introduce myself quickly, I'm a University of Minnesota research coordinator. Uh, I work with Dr. Kareem Sadak and Dr. Lucy Turcott and Dr. Ann Blaze uh, in the Cancer Survivorship Program. Um, I'm really excited to be here today um, to be part of this community just for a moment um, rather than being behind the research scenes. So uh, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. Um, our presenters for this session are Melissa Clare and Dr. Erica Timko Olson. As a pediatric nurse practitioner, Melissa Clare has been fortunate to serve hematology oncology patients and families since 2008. As a witness to each individual's journey, she learned the importance of a whole person approach that honors the mind, body, spirit, and community elements of care. Furthermore, engaging in patient and relationship-centered care with the ability to promote overall health and well-being despite the presence of illness or chronic disease is of the utmost importance. Partnering with families and other professionals to proactively support optimal nutrition, sleep, physical activity, and a healthy mind-body connection has become her passion. Honoring the benefits of modern conventional medicine while also incorporating integrative approaches is what led her to pursue additional expertise as a current Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine Fellow. Empowering patients and families is at the heart of her practice. Dr. Erica Timko Olson is a clinical assistant professor at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities School of Nursing. Dr. Timko Olson is an integrative nurse faculty fellow and a Marilyn Syme research fellow with the Earl E. Bakken Center for Spirituality and Healing and has been a professor for over 20 years. Her area of research is focused on integrative nursing and well being with a particular interest in the role of nature and forest therapy on the psychological and social well being of adolescent and young adult cancer survivors. So um, just a couple of notes about today's session. We'll be using Calm Aroma inhalers for our in-person attendees. Um, if you are pregnant or breastfeeding, we recommend that you use the Lavender Choice, which is in um, some of the bowls in the back of the room. Um, for our virtual audience, um, you can review the conference website for a list of resources, including from our generous donate donor, Plant Extract International. You can choose to order products from them if you're interested. Now, before we kick things off, um, I wanted to share just a few ground rules for our session. Um, first, the goal of the session is to help those in attendance feel better, more hopeful, and not so alone. We're not gonna talk about specific diagnoses or treatments or give medical advice. We're not going to discuss side effect management, and we're not he here to deal with practical problems like work, childcare, medical system navigation, because that will be there at the end as well. Um, if you're joining us online, our in-room moderator, Sue, is following along with your comments, so feel free to chat in supportive comments and related questions um, in the chat. Um, we'll have time for non-related Q&A at the end of the session. Um, thank you, and um, please join me in welcoming our presenters for today. I don't know about you. Is this on? Can you hear me? Oh, there we go. I don't know about you, but what a joy to see a full room of people. It's It's been a long three years for those of us who do this on a regular basis to see smiling faces and um, people who are happy to be out. So thank you very much. I just want to, we're, the order, I'm going to introduce myself um, briefly, and then Melissa's going to, and she's going to kind of take the first half. So my again, my name is Erica Timko Olson. I am a clinical assistant professor at the School of Nursing at the University of Minnesota, and I am so grateful that I have been invited to share my research and my passion with you today. I was born in North America on Turtle Island on the ancestral lands of the Ojibwe people in the United States, in the upper Midwest, in Minnesota, which is Sioux for sky tinged water, in the prairies of the southwest portion of the state, as the fifth generation on a family farm. My ancestors are from Eastern Europe and Scandinavia. I tell you this um, as a reminder that we all have a deep connection to our space and our time in which our ancestors came from. That connection to nature is also older than those ancestors who first inhabited this space. My passion and research work to support a greater connection to ourselves and to nature. 
it all comes down to a simple statement for me in that you simply cannot love what you do not know. And now Melissa will take it over. Thank you very much. I'm old, so I need cheaters. So my name is Melissa Clare. Thank you so much for coming today. It's really my honor and pleasure to be spending this Saturday um, with you. Um, as was already introduced, I've served patients and families affected by hematologic or oncologic disorders for 15 years. Um, my deep appreciation for human resiliency as well shared with the power of the mind-body connection, sorry, we were having a little bit of feedback, um, had led me to my integrative, integrative studies. So I'm a second um, year fellow through the Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine. My clinical practice is at M Health Fairview um, Children's within this particular specialty. Um, and my hope is that by providing an introductory um, overview of integrative self-care recommendations, you could leave today with one, two, or even maybe more um, strategies that resonate with you personally. Could you imagine taking an active role in protecting your own well-being and happiness, and in particular during periods of stress? This is the exact definition that the Oxford Languages Dictionary provides for the term self-care. We'd like to invite everybody to participate in a mindful breathing activity. For those of you in person, you each have your um, aromatherapeutic sticks that were donated by Plant Extracts International. They contain the pure essential oils from plants, lavender, which is known to be calming and relaxing, frankincense, which has a grounding effect, blue cypress can be uplifting, and then of course tea tree, which helps to relieve anxiety and stress. You can either use the little clip on the side and clip it to your shirt, your lanyard, or you can certainly just hold on to it, whatever you prefer. This method of breathing is going to consist of inhaling deeply from our belly for four seconds, holding for seven seconds, and then slowly and steadily exhaling for eight seconds. The most important part about breath work is that you don't worry about if you're doing it right. Instead, just allow it to be. If you feel like you need to take the next breath before it's time, feel free. So we'll begin if everybody could settle into their chair, maybe begin to feel a little bit more comfortable. You might even notice the chair beneath your bottom or your feet planted on the floor just feeling fully and completely supported, allowing your facial expression to soften and your shoulders to just melt down by your sides. Choosing to perhaps place your hands on your belly as that relaxation permeates all the way down to the tips of your toes tuning in to the calm you are cultivating.
might notice how you feel now compared to just less than two minutes and five breaths ago. So what is integrative health and medicine anyways, you might ask? Well, in a nutshell, it's the practice of seeing each of you as a whole person made up of your mind, your body, your spirit, and your community, whatever that means for each of you. It can be different from one person to the next, but it could also be different for the same person at different points in time across the lifespan. Clinically integrative strives to be relationship and partnership based, equipping patients and families with tools that they can use, they can harness themselves to really ultimately help themselves. It's preventative and proactive in nature. And ultimately, it's about respecting and understanding the deeper essence of every person. Today, we'll explore the four fundamental pillars at the heart of integrative medicine. Nutrition, physical activity, sleep, and mood, each of which all living beings need. Though these are familiar words to us, at the time of a cancer diagnosis, the whole world stops and things change. People go into survival mode. The golden nugget, however, is that each of these areas is modifiable and largely within our control. This can be empowering. So how do we thrive and not only survive? Perhaps by intentionally making small changes, simple things that could ultimately have a tremendous impact both in the present and in the future, mitigating some of the late effects of cancer and its treatment. So let's talk a little bit about nutrition, nourishing our bodies as well as our sense of being. Some of the ways might include striving to eat from every color of the rainbow every day. Eating more plants, knowing that they offer us fiber, vitamin, and minerals that are essential for energy, neurocognitive, immune, and digestive health. Including spices like garlic, turmeric, ginger, and cinnamon, knowing that they contain anti-inflammatory properties. Optimizing, of course, our intake of whole foods and really striving to sort of reduce those that come from cans, boxes, bags, whenever possible. Ensuring we get adequate protein throughout the day and those healthy unsaturated fats, right? It used to be when I was growing up, everybody wanted to be on the low fat diet. Well, we now know we need fats. We just need the right kind. So those healthy fats um, are the unsaturated ones or those that turn liquid when they're at room temperature. Protein and healthy fats give us the sustainable energy we need to, to last through the day. And omega-3 fatty acids that come from sort of fish, eggs, nuts, seeds, and leafy greens can help support our mood and our brain function. Of course, striving to be mindful when eating, enjoying the company you keep, such as my mom here, with a glass of white wine and oysters on a hot summer day. Here are a few examples of how you might in real time, make just even small changes. So you could enjoy a meal with laughter as the keynote speaker was alluding to with friends, um, putting your phones aside, or maybe at lunchtime you decide I'm gonna take 15 minutes, I'm gonna sit outside and I'm not gonna multitask and I'm gonna eat even if once a week. Sometimes my goal is once a month. You might decide to plant an herb pot in your windowsill, or like my dog here next to our strawberry um, patch in the backyard. You could cut up some fresh garlic to throw in with um, either roasted or sauteed veggies. And of course, keeping in mind that it's important to drink water throughout the day. I don't know about all of you, but my biggest thing is I don't want to have to go to the bathroom when I'm in a busy day, but you know this is not good for you, right? So then this is my go-to. I plan how much I need to drink in a day and I keep it with me, both so that I can be pacing out my time of drinking 
as well as using something that's reusable and sustainable for Mother Earth and doesn't contain the plastic um, that can have harmful chemicals um, impacting our environmental health or pesticide exposure. Um, certainly being mindful by um, observing both the texture, the colors, um, as well as the temperature of food, both as you're preparing it and consuming. The EWG or Environmental Working Group produces an annual list um, of the clean 15 or dirty um, dozen. This is just simply a guide that you could utilize um, to help support your organic purchasing um, habits. Again, to reduce your risk for exposure to pesticides. Moving in to our second pillar, physical activity. Or if you're my cat, Loki, you might say, do I have to? I'm so comfy. But what if it looked like this? Going out on a hike at sunrise or participating in alpaca yoga with friends. Not only supporting, they are very curious by the way, they're very sweet. Not only supporting phys your physical heart, but also your emotional heart, right? Eliciting joy. For some, it could be an intense workout routine, but for others, it could simply be going on a bike ride with your partner, heading out to the skate park with friends, or even maybe deciding to take the steps instead of the elevator sometimes. Either way, all of these aim to support, um, maintain, and improve our muscle tone, our bone strength, our balance, and flexibility. It also releases serotonin in our brain, which is that happy, feel-good hormone. And in the end, moving our bodies in meaningful ways gives us the ability to maintain functionality so we can continue to participate the things that fill our cup throughout the rest of our lives. With that, let's put it into a little bit of practice. So again, similar to the breathing exercise, don't get caught up in doing anything correctly. Just enjoy yourself. This is my dream, by the way. Ah. <laughs> well, here you go. Here's a little sampling. So what we'll do, we'll begin. We're going to just do some shoulder rolls. So you can place your hands on your shoulders, putting your elbow points together. And if you feel like it, you're welcome to stand up, but you certainly don't have to. And then on an inhale, we're gonna bring our shoulders up and our elbows up and then exhale, bring them down. And let's put them back together. And then a big inhale and then exhale. We're gonna move into Eagle Arms Pose. So what that looks like, is I did this with my husband last night and he could not quite get his palms to connect. Again, it's not that it's per perfect that's important. It's the intention behind it. So we're gonna take our arms and we're gonna swing our right arm underneath our left. Squeeze and twist your hands together as best as you can, wherever things meet. And then we're gonna drop our arms down to the left while we let our right ear melt. So op opposing, yeah. And as you do it, just take a nice big breath. You might feel that stretch along the backside of your neck. And then we're gonna unwind. And this time we're gonna put our left arm under our right. And then we're gonna go the opposite direction. So arms to the right, ear to the left, ear to the left. And a nice big breath. And then we're gonna do some seated cow cat poses. You can see the pictures. And of course, sweet Erica is gonna demonstrate. So we'll start out with cow and put your hands on your knees. We're gonna arch your back and you're gonna open your chest and look up and take a nice big breath in. We're gonna pretend we're a cat. We're gonna arch our back, kind of chin down to your tummy and breathe out. And then we're gonna do the opposite side, other arm down, and again, side angle. There you go. So just in those couple of moments, right? We cultivated a little bit of physical movement, namaste. <laughs> um, and I don't know about you, but I'm like, I'm warm from doing, right? My heart's pumping a little bit. 
but sometimes just pairing our breath with movement can be so relaxing, but it also makes us move our bodies. We're gonna turn our attention now to the third pillar of sleep. Sleep, simply put, is vital. We all kind of know that. It allows for mental stillness and clarity of mind, which then leads to focus for the day ahead. While we're hopefully catching those restful Zs, our bodies are literally repairing itself. For example, the glial cells within our brain run around and clean up all the metabolic and neurotoxic waste that was created from the day. Sleep promotes optimal memory and cognitive function. It supports neuroplasticity or that um, our way to our body's ability to sort of adapt and create new patterns of behavior. And it maintains our immune responses. So how do we achieve that seven to eight hours of sleep nightly that an adult typically needs? It's going to sound silly. It's going to feel like we're toddlers, but creating a bedtime routine, right? That avoids ideally screens because we know that the blue light within screens um, reduces both the production and release of melatonin, which is a hormone in the brain that's important for setting, setting our sleep wake cycle. Additionally, the television, while it might not have blue light, is stimulating. And we are in this last hour really trying to tell our brain, our body, it's time to rest and restore now. So preparing an environment that's dark, cool, and free of distractions is equally important. Some strategies could be maybe you figure out what time you need to get up in the morning and you count back seven or eight hours. And this is how you set your bedtime. And then you go to bed at the same time every night as much as possible. Creating a routine in that final hour leading up to bedtime could be something simple like drinking nighty night tea, right? To help sort of tone, set the tone for winding down. Bathing in Epsom salts, absorbing some of the magnesium before crawling into bed. Reading a book or journaling. I've especially found a gratitude journal to be really helpful because it does a lot of sort of reframing things into a positive light, maybe focusing a little bit less on the things that are bothersome. And then the Insight Timer is a free app that has a plethora of um, opportunities, sleep meditation, sound, um, sleep stories, and soundscapes of nature, if you would like. Sound sleep certainly supports our fourth and final pillar our mental well-being. The interconnectedness of the body, body and mind is undeniable. Our physical health undoubtedly impacts our mental well-being. And what happens in the mind influences and affects our physical body. So let's imagine we're out on a walk and we happen upon a bear. Before we even realize it, the stress response kick is in. We either fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, probably words many of us have heard, right? So we either fight back, we run away, we freeze because we panic, or we hide. This is a protective survival mechanism. It's not a personal flaw, it happens. It's automatic, stemming from our autonomic nervous system. This is comprised of the sympathetic and parasympathetic responses. When we're faced with a life-threatening situation, such as a diagnosis of cancer, a cascade response ensues. It arises again from that sympathetic nervous system stress response. The amygdala, which is in our brain, acts as a sounding alarm, which then tells the hippocampus or our control panel to result in the release of stress hormones as adrenaline and cortisol. Physiologically, this presents as a faster heartbeat, rapid, shallow breathing, quick thinking due to increased alertness. Remember, this is protective. It's a normal response that happens to us when we face either an actual or a perceived threat. So even if that bear was totally disinterested in us and instead of munching on some berries, we would still have that automatic stress response. When it comes to supporting our mental well-being, it's important that the brain and the body return to that opposite response, the parasympathetic rest and digest state. It's known as the relaxation response. It's where we feel safe, 
to rest. It's where we feel safe to digest because we're no longer worried if we're going to make it to our next meal. However, if that stress, pers stress response persists without any respite, we remain in a heightened state, which then leads to brain fog, and we can shut down emotionally. This is one of the many, many reasons that it's vital we work to strengthen this parasympathetic relaxation response. When we let go of what we cannot control and instead embrace what we can, then we're better able to support ourselves. We can intentionally engage in the care of self. Mind-body self-care is vast. Here's just a few of the, the suggestions that we might have. It can range from acupoint to aromatherapy, as you just used with your aroma inhalers, or breath work like that 478 method. You notice we breathe deep from our belly. When you're in the stress response, you're breathing from your chest. So by breathing from your belly, you're essentially telling your brain, I am okay. And your brain will follow suit. Pretty cool that we can cultivate that. Creative arts, so it might be knitting, it might be drawing or painting, collaging, whatever it might be. Of course, we can never underestimate the importance of community, connections, and relationships distracting ourselves, getting a massage, participating in med meditation or mindfulness, and of course, supporting our mental health when it's needed. Nature, as Erica, Dr. Tim Coast um, Olson will be um, going through, reframing, we sort of mentioned, and then spirituality, which does not have to be religion. It can be whatever you get hope from or meaning from. And then the meditative arts, like yoga, qigong, or tai chi. In summary, obtaining a cure or ending a problem and also healing or the process of living in questions, trusting the emergence of restoring ourselves are vital to living. I don't know about you, but I'd like all of those things right now. We should have practiced sleep. Yeah. That would have been nice. I could, I'm good at that. I could lead you in a sleep exercise. That would be amazing. Um, as a mom of six kids, sleep is the most important thing. And the only real the only reason there's more than one is because they slept. <laughs> My fourth born, it's like, who's your favorite kid? I'm like, everyone's like, Philip, why? Because everyone knows he slept through the night first. So <laughs> Philip, favorite child at 16, still favorite child. Yes, he, yes, he is. Um, in all things, just because. I slept. So I remembered how great he was as a child. So next time he'll come back on the afternoon. Maybe we'll have a nap session. Um, we'll see. So uh, thank you so much. What a, what a great um, segue into the next piece here. I exist as I am, and that is enough. If no other in the world be aware, I sit content. And if each and all be aware, I sit content. One world is aware and by far the largest to me, and that is myself. And whether I come to my own today or in 10,000 or 10 million years, I can cheerfully take it now or with equal cheerfulness, I can wait. This is the leaves of the grass. As the leaves of the grass, we are nature. We don't know exactly what the day, the year, or a million years will bring, but we take what nature has to offer us, or we wait. Either is fine. As we understand what nature is, who nature is, and who we are, we often find that many of us live in opposition to what nature shows us. We are hurried, stressed, in need of being in control, 
And nothing is more apparent in this as when we see our young adults encounter healthcare and ourselves a cancer diagnosis. I came to understand the crisis as a sister, a daughter, a clinician, a teacher, and a researcher. So I decided to further my own research in this area of forest bathing and mindful interaction with nature. As we begin, I would like you to think about what is nature to you? Where are you from? What does this mean for you? What were your surroundings like growing up? And what are they like now? Where do you spend your time? How many minutes per week do you spend in nature? You may have heard that 120 minutes outdoors is the new 10,000 steps. Why is that? Research in London found that spending at least 120 minutes in nature led to good health and well being. And they found that these benefits continued to increase the more time you spent in nature, up to five hours a week. So that's my call for you today. Think about how you can get a minimum of two hours a week in nature. Breaking that down, 15 minutes a day or more would be great. Mindfulness has a long history dating back to the Buddhist traditions in the first century BC. This history has countless understandings and several historical theories. Mindfulness varies in practice with clinical, philosophical, religious, and secular approaches. But all of these complexities within the space of mindfulness, it's really surprisingly not difficult that they all can come together and have a common understanding and common ground in writing and teachings. There are two main purposes to this ancient practice, coping and the elimination of suffering and positive changes in emotional state. These lead to changes in behavior. This has been simplified over the centuries to the understanding of awareness of one's internal states and surroundings, paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, non-judgmentally. And when mindfulness is practiced and achieved, there is improvement in mental, physical, emotion, and emotional and spiritual well-being. The Japanese characters here, or kanji, for Shinrin Yoku are before you. The first character represents a forest with the three trees. The second character symbolizes a wood. And the third character corresponds with bathe, flowing water on the left of the character and a valley on the right. When translated into English, it means forest bathing. And it's similar to the English nuance of sunbathing. The practice of slow, slowly and mindfully walking in the forest environment while using all five senses led Japanese scientists to research the physiological and psychological outcomes of experiencing nature. The need for mental health support and intervention was expedited during the COVID-19 pandemic. My colleagues and I completed a review of the literature understanding the role of mindfulness and forest bathing on our psychological well-being. And no surprise to any of us, we found that there was a significant relationship between them with as much as a 40% reduction in symptom burden for people that experienced mindfulness in nature. This is specifically important to at-risk groups, those who experience depression, loneliness, social isolation, this was most of us during COVID. An at-risk population such as college students, veterans, professionals with high levels of stress, as well as those with chronic disease. This year in the United States, almost 90,000 adolescents and young adults will be diagnosed with cancer. 
That number jumps to 1.2 million worldwide with the highest incidence in Western Europe and the highest mortality rates in Oceania. The global burden of cancer is substantial and disproportionately affects populations in limited resource settings. Capacity building is essential in promoting equity and population health worldwide. Though the five-year survival rates has significantly improved, there are still significant gaps. Because young adults in particular are at greater risk of long-term and late-term effects of cancer and cancer treatments compared to others, it's critical to identify um, interventions that can improve the quality of life of survivors. So I had the pleasure of doing a qualitative study that was funded through Nature and Forest Therapy as well as Sigma International, um, where I had the pleasure of meeting with young adult cancer survivors. And this is what they told me when I asked them what their psychological needs were. They said that they were changed forever, that they really leaned into therapy, that they needed to focus on themselves and their treatment. There were so many unknowns and so much pain. It was really just unbelievable for them. And they were very overwhelmed. When I asked them about their social needs, they just wanted people to understand. They wanted people to check in. They became very dependent. Now this is a group that's just recently gained their independence. So being dependent was one of the biggest challenges for them. They didn't want to be a burden to their parents, to their new spouses, to their new boyfriend, girlfriend. They're, they felt significantly disconnected and isolated. And some people felt that others blamed them for their disease. The things that were in common between the psychological needs and their social needs were these things that I found. They wanted to fight. They were anxious. They needed support. They wanted to maintain their relationships, but they were changed. They wanted friends. It really changed their perspective. And within that, changed their relationships with their family. And every single one of them mentioned their concerns around fertility and trauma. But then I asked them, what does nature mean to you? And survivors reported that nature was stillness. It gave them peace. It was everything from the breeze to the sunshine, a place to disconnect and be in silence. They didn't feel alone and they didn't feel like they had cancer when they were in nature because it was so big and they were so small. They liked listening to the birds or the stillness. And most of the psychosocial changes, challenges that they reported were mitigated with time in nature. These are just a couple of things that they said. What it means to me is now something so different than a couple of years ago. I mean, everything is the first word that comes into my mind. There's like a flood of words. So it feels like everything. Nature is everything. It's real. It's healing. It's powerful. It's humbling. These are the things I think of. Everything's going on within natural disasters and climate change and all that stuff. But I'm just so humbled by nature. And it's incredibly healing and real to me. Uh, recently, I pulled together another review looking at nature-based interventions and exposures among cancer survivors. And this was 12 studies that I looked at with over 2,700 survivors from um, the studies were done all over the world. Only, I think only two of them were in the United States. The results showed improvements in anxiety, depression, sleep, connectedness, stress, tension, confusion, fatigue, pain, um, but the participants, this was a very large Swedish study, uh, reported that nature was the most important resource in coping with their cancer. 
So what we found from this and previous work and that's moving us forward in our next study that we're launching shortly is that nature is beneficial for cancer survivors. We know that while they experience a diagnosis and treatment, nature opportunities can be feasibly delivered and need to be explored further and safely Im implemented to support the health and well-being of cancer survivors. This is actually um, something that comes out from the U.S. government of all places. Um, the EPA looks at our eco health and what our relationships are. And if you look on the, I wonder if I have a, do I have a pointer? Oh, I have a pointer. That's fun. Um, <laughs> These <laughs> the little things in life, I'm telling you. Um, you can follow where my brain goes. So as the forest, forest feeds in, so these are the things that strengthen us, right? The forest, the wetlands, the urban ecosystems that I do a lot of work with, um, equity and green space and um, environmental justice, um, agro ecosystems, even dry land. So people are always like, can you go forest bathing in the desert? I've done it. It's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. So yes. So when we talk about forest bathing, it's really not just in the forest. But, um, so all of these things feed in and strengthen us. And what does that lead to? It helps vulnerable populations. Increases in vision, craziness, stress, community ties. Think about a community garden, how that brings together people. Decreases crime, increases mindful eating. We know where our food is coming from. In decreases obesity, increases activity, all through a community garden. Our increase in self-esteem, decrease in respiratory problems, PTSD with our veterans. We do a significant amount of work in nature therapy with that decrease obesity, decrease mortality, increase mental health, longevity, immune system, natural killer cells increase, really important for survivors here. Decreases in blood pressure, healing, happiness, fatigue, diabetes. Like I could just go on forever. I am. Um, cardiovascular, bronchitis. Our babies have higher birth weights craziness, decrease anxiety, amazing, decrease asthma, obviously, the trees, um, reduce our, uh, the, um, increase our air quality, decreased aggression, the tree canopy in areas in Philadelphia, the increase, the greater the tree canopy, there's less crime, there's less aggression, in the inner city, I don't know if I, I lived close to Philadelphia for a year. It was a very traumatic experience for me being from Minnesota. But wow, you think about what the green space, urban green space can do in our environment. Do you have a question? Yeah, correct for other contexts. Like oh, every, yeah. Trees. There's, there's, um, there's um, parkway trees. There's sides of the trees. There is the placement of the trees. There's the type of tree. So yeah, I mean, researchers have to look at every single variable and then. Yeah. So yeah, amazing work that's going on in these areas. Um, but look at all of this. And I just focus on the psychosocial and, and mental well-being and all of these other things are fun byproducts of that. So really, what is nature therapy? It's defined as a set of practices aimed at achieving preventative effects through exposure to natural stimuli that release a state of physiological relaxation boost the weakened immune system to prevent disease. So practically speaking then, what are the options? What can you do? What does spending time in nature look like? Well, there is adventure therapy. Some of us a little less adventurous than others, um, but these activities can explore nature and can be done with individuals and groups. Rafting, rock climbing. I usually get about three feet off the ground. Um, canoeing in the boundary water is my personal favorite. That's what this picture is from. It doesn't have to be uh, a you know, six-day adventure. It can be 15 minutes of just going off a dock and coming back. There is animal-assisted therapy. We saw the alpacas, and now we're going to see some goats here. So both of these options include spending time with animals, animal-assisted interventions, locations like farms where you can feed animals and pet animals is really healthy. On the other hand, there is um, animal-assisted therapy that focuses on building therapeutic relationships with dogs or horses. Uh, my my dad was a, a goat farmer, so um, goats are the cutest dumbest creatures that have ever been created, but they're so adorable. You can't really get upset with them, but 
I don't know if they, I mean, something that eats a tin can really just needs some help, but that's a whole other issue. <laughs> There's arts and crafts in nature. Like the name suggests, this type combines creative arts with nature. You might use these skills to paint outside in a green space, like in a forest or a park, or even on your front step. This type also includes natural elements like clay, grass, wood, or using green space as an inspiration for art. We were um, in quarantine for my daughter's 16th birthday, and she has um, a significant chronic disease. And so we gave her a pottery wheel. Now she had she had thrown pottery before and her godmother delivered a big chunk of clay on the front porch. I think that was significant to her healing. I'm like, she sits down and is just like, mm. you know, I sit down and I'm like, uh, like I've, I've never done it. I, I watch her and I'm like, this is amazing. But that the natural feel of the clay in her hands is, it is like, I felt healing from watching that. It, it's just a beautiful thing when people have gifts and talents. There's conservation. So looking at protective spaces and you can combine this with some activity as well. Or wilderness therapy. This type works well with a group. You spend time in the wild doing things like hiking or making shelters. Again, this doesn't have to be in the boundary waters. This can be in your neighborhood park. And um, we went for a walk one time. My son is a, a student at St. John's and somebody had taken leaves and it was it was in the fall, but early fall and took, it started with green leaves. It was maybe only a foot wide green leaves. And then it gradually went in an ombre to like these bright yellow leaves. And they just left this beautiful gift right on the trail. And we're walking and I'm like, oh, and then I stopped and took a picture. And then I saw it and it might've been a class or practice. somebody had built like these just little, they look like little fairy huts and they had just taken the grass and the leaves and some sticks and just made these little tiny shelters. And it just made us stop and breathe. And here I was like, I'm gonna hike here. I've got a three mile hike, I'm going. And it just made us stop and be like, oh, we took deeper breaths and it changed our entire conversation. It was, what are we doing? What's the bill? How do we get it paid? Where are we going? What's the, like, it was boom, 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 right? Check the list. And it, it, and it moved to, oh, did you notice that? The wind has changed. It feels different on my face. Look at that. Look at the leaves. Oh, I didn't notice how they're changing so quickly. Oh, there's some that are red there. So it just changed to help us notice more what's in front of us. There's dark nature. Dark nature activities take place at night. So stargazing. This picture on the left, I live in Chaska. This is out, out my front porch. Like, what was it? Like three weeks ago when the Northern Lights were out? My husband was out walking the dog and he's like, it's crazy at our house. Like everyone's in bed and he's like, the Northern Lights and everybody is on the front porch. I'm like, forget sleep. We're like watching this. And this was just my, my dirty lens on my phone, you know, just right. Like the neighbor's lights, house lights are all on. And it's just that noticing and being present in that. And I can still go back to that night in this picture. And that's the other cool thing about this, right? And then there's green exercise. And um, if you like to run on a treadmill or work on the treadmill, think about maybe taking that outside, lifting weights. You can take those little hand weights onto your front porch and do that if there's some activity you like to do. Take up bike riding, walking, doesn't have to be strenuous. There's therapeutic farming. Oh my gosh. I grew up on a sheep farm. Like, oh, I just, if they could just stay little, it'd be so great. Um, in this type, you participate in farm activities. So you might help grow crops or take care of animals. There are farms in the area, especially that are owned by our park systems where we can go and we can feed the animals. You can feed the animals at the zoo. You can probably help milk the cows at the zoo. Um, great things. And they're just so cute in the spring with these baby animals. And then there's therapeutic horticulture, which we talked a little bit about that involves gardening. So you might grow food in a community garden. Sometimes that therapeutic horticulture leads to other activities like selling homegrown crops at a farmer's market. Knowing where your food comes from can significantly help our well being. More research continues on the positive effects of spending time in nature. This is a free app, it's called Nature Dose. I use it in my research studies actually. And it's produced by NatureQuant. 
And you can use this to keep track of your time in nature and you can set your weekly goal and then it sends you a few tips and benefits of being in nature. So check this out if it interests you. So this is like the true test, right? So here we are, what day is today? Saturday, good to know. So this week I have spent, cause it start, restarts on Sunday. This week I have spent 272 minutes in nature um, full disclosure, my son forgot his shorts for tennis and his match went into the second set and then they won. And then it went into the third set and they tied and it went to a tiebreaker. So a lot of this time was not intentional because I had to stand outside at a tennis match, though that is the favorite child that slept. So it's okay. <laughs> it also gives you little tips like on the bottom, it says stop inflammation. Research shows that participating in nature activities reduces inflammation biomarkers like IL-6, which has been linked to asthma. So it gives you little links and then click it. Can you all see these little leaves here? It tells you where you're at right now, what the quality of nature is. Right now it is 69.6, pretty good. Significant health advantage, natural environment. So when I see this, I can say, hey, now take a short lunch and then go outside if it's not raining. Even if it is raining, it's the best time to be outside because you can hear a lot of great things. But I'd say, go outside. Now, if that were red, like I was at a well-being conference in Las Vegas, like why, why would those two things ever go together? It was never above five the entire week, even when I was standing in front of the Bellagio fountain. Uh, like, gross. Um, I know. I don't take these conferences at the Boundary Waters. Like, isn't that where everyone wants to go? I mean, it's so accessible to everyone. Um, my house, it is, you know, two years ago at my house, it was 96. Um, I just checked it the other day. It's 93. So either there was an air quality issue or, you know, they're building a few houses around or, you know, there's a reuptake. There's like 30 different government available, publicly available sites that this is all built from. Um, a, a big data guy does it out of Oregon. He's amazing. So just take a look at it. What I think is important about that is that if I was a provider and would say, hey, go out and spend two hours in nature. But if the nature score at your house was 96, I'd say, go well, sit in your backyard, right? Because it has a map. If your nature score is 10, then that conversation is a little bit more involved to say, okay, so where can we, where can you take the bus? Where can you engage with nature that's a little bit more dense and healthy and meaningful for your health where you can get there, you know, get there relatively, relatively easily. So I think that, you know, this can lead to some good conversations, but I use it in my research to tell people where to go. Like, can you walk out your front yard? Yes. Can you, uh, maybe not the best place to go, but um, it's really meaningful for me. So check it out and see if it's something that interests you. So finally, these are my two girls, my oldest two girls at the lake. They're like two little peas in a pod. Mindfulness and forest bathing support the health and healing of both self and nature. Well-being is greatly enhanced and supported when humanity can slow down, be present, be mindful, rest in the woods, and allow the healing power of nature to perform her healing work from within. So let's get comfortable in our seats again, whatever that means for you. Let's just begin by taking a moment to bring your full attention into the present. If that's hard for you, completely fine. Again, remember mindfulness is being present, not judgmentally. So as thoughts come in and out of your mind, just acknowledge them and let them go. Settle your body. You can close your eyes, or if you prefer, keep them open with a soft gaze looking down. Sit upright with good posture. Allow your shoulders to relax. Let's just take a few deep breaths here. Gently begin to open your eyes. 
and your ears to the sound of the slow moving stream. Continue to take deep breaths as we listen to the water flowing over the rocks. You can choose to do this with your eyes closed or open. If your eyes are open, notice the rippling of the water as it dances and flows over the rocks. Now notice the bird song. How many tones can you hear? Focus on one song for a few breaths. And move your attention to the next. What do you notice about your body? Are you restless, calm, settled? Do you have memories that come to you in this moment? Or is your mind clear? Can you imagine the warm sun on your face? Maybe it's blinding a bit. Maybe you need to close your eyes. Can you feel the cool stream if you dip your toes in? Maybe the mud sinks between your toes. Is this welcomed or do you prefer the grass? Do you prefer warm stones? Or maybe you want to leave your shoes on. As much as it would be great to stay here all day. Let's come back. And remember this feeling. Remember that nature is always calling you back into relationship. And you can even adventure in your mind. And just a reminder, if this was difficult for you, that's okay. It's, it's a practice that takes time to develop. You might need to start with two minutes or two seconds and then build up if this is something that interests you. So we thank you for coming today and for your time. And we um, open it up to any questions that you might have, or if there's questions online. And speaking about like water and everything, you hear about like certain kind of waters being better alkaline, non-alkaline, all that kind of crazy stuff. Spring, non-spring. Do you ever have like, do you have any opinions on that? From like health professor? I have zero opinions on that. Get outside listen to the water it's different if you're ingesting it um yeah ingesting is a total different piece but as far as like the forest bathing piece um other than if like the waters are contaminated obviously you're not in them but um, it's a different story and certainly if you're going through any active chemotherapy or treatment that would be worth chatting with your provider about um specifically with regard to what sort of elements of water you can be in during, you know, when you're immunosuppressed, for instance. But um, in terms of drinking water, honestly, most of the bottled water that we get is actually tap watered. Yeah, so don't waste your money and don't fill the landfills if you can, um, but otherwise, no. Yeah, using just a filter is fine. Mm -hmm. Tap water in St. Paul's great, that's what I drink. Um, I guess I had a question about the forest bathing and um, like na finding nature. Like, do you have any resources for finding like accessible parks that have like paved areas or like even trails, things like that? Absolutely. I mean, there's definitely accessible areas. Um, in there's a lot of state parks that have specific trails. Um, there actually is close to here at Silverwood Park. There is actually a forest. Uh, uh, one of the, it is the only certified wellness trail in Minnesota. And it has signage, a dear friend of mine who worked on that, a forest bathing 
um, guide. So that's right here in St. Anthony. Um, really just looking at, I know Three Rivers has a lot of great parks with paved trails. Um, there, I mean, we are in such a great area. If you can, you know, be out of like the main downtown urban areas, there's a lot of great trails and safe trails to be on. Um, you, and our websites are so easy just to look them up and you can see particular things. Does that answer your question? Okay. And if you live in a particular area too, there's great resources through like the park and recs department. I'm just wondering how much you would qualify in this um, being in nature in gardening. So like I have a um, Minnesota native um, shade garden and a Minnesota native sun garden and I like to spend time out there and that's in my yard so it's a very easy thing to do. Does that count? These plants are mine in my office and look at her. She's blooming today just for you. Um, who knows? It's Christmas and Easter all together. I was joking that she needs, needs to learn the liturgical calendar for when to bloom, but um, this is spending time with nature. My, my daughter is seven, and she'll go up, and she'll be like, you know, and I have some big plants, and I'm like, what are you doing? And she's like, I'm feeding the plants. Like, she's feeding her soul. Like, she knows that. She feels better when she goes up and hangs out by the palm tree and the fiddle leaf fig tree, and she's just like... So gardening, oh my gosh, the benefits of gardening are immense. Not only because you're, you know, growing food and things, but native, diverse gardens are good for our immune systems, are good for our mental and physical well-being. So yes, garden. Garden if you can, if you have the space. Lovely. And then come help me with my gardens. <laughs> I am building a butterfly yeah, I am building a butterfly tea garden. So all the plants are safe for um, infusing teas, but also good for the butterflies. So my husband, or for the bees, sorry. My husband's like, yeah, my wife's going to go have bee um, tea with the bees. He jokes about my gardens. Hi, thank you both so much for this presentation. I do have to disclaim I'm one of the planning committee members, but we are, um, as part of our Thrive series, that's in the fall, we have a special topic on forest bathing and we're actually gonna have an event. So you can say, look on the survivorship.umn.edu website. And then I do know um, the Arboretum hosted a forest bathing series and they're all sold out now, but I think it's coming more to Minnesota. So just you know, to add to what she was saying, you know, just keep your eyes out and look for it. But certainly in the fall, we've got we've got a, a additional series on forest bathing coming up. So thank you. And to that point, I was going to say you don't have to necessarily make it into a big ordeal, right? It could simply be going out into your backyard or stepping outside and just sort of walking through stillness and like running through the five senses. What do you see? What do you hear? What do you feel? You might feel something externally like the sun beaming down on your skin or the wind breezing across your face. You might even notice what you feel internally. You might, if you're having a moment of stress and right before you embarked on it, you might be feeling your heart pounding. You might actually start to notice your breath. You might feel your breath coming in and out of your nostrils and the temperature of that moist air. So it's really about, you know, just being mindful and present in the moment. It doesn't have to be complex. I mean, being in a forest is obviously gonna enhance that, and there's so much more to look at, but you can cultivate the same things on a functional MRI. Those dopamine receptors light up in your brain like you're doing something really profound just by cultivating, even in your mind, you magic, close your eyeballs and imagine you're on a hike, you know, or you're snowshoeing. That's a good point. My favorite is winter, being involved, or uh, being out in winter in snowshoeing. Like if you've ever been up to Gooseberry, the views in the winter are 10,000 better, 10,000 times better than the views in the summer because you can see the entire lake because all the trees are gone. Um, it's absolutely gorgeous. And um, there's no crowds. <laughs> so dress warm and you know put on your snowshoes if you can. And you can even see views from the bridge. You don't have to hike deep into the woods. 
So there's great things in the winter, and the Arboretum has a lot of programs. There's, there's um, actually someone from the university, they've had programs here for several years, but someone from the university is now, she's a librarian and she's great, but we are losing her out to the Arboretum. Um, and also, if anyone's familiar with Charleston Meadows, I can encourage you to look at their programming. They have some amazing opportunities. They have beautiful space. Again, that's west, again, out in Victoria um, by the Arboretum. So. Charleston Meadow, Meadows. Charleston Meadows. Thanks, everybody.